Our guest today is one of Mayor Daley's top troubleshooters. Just over two years ago, he was thrust into the current role as Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Housing Authority, where he oversees the CHA's bold $1.7 billion redevelopment of public housing in Chicago. It is a daunting responsibility. Our guest today has a bachelor's degree from Chicago State University and a master's degree from Roosevelt University. He spent four years in the early 1990s as 17th Ward Chief of Staff to the Alderman. When an aldermanic vacancy was created in the 17th Ward, our guest today was appointed by Mayor Daley to fill that vacancy. He not only completed the unexpired term, he was also re-elected, garnering more than 80% of the vote. His appointment to the Chicago Housing Authority has been widely applauded and reflects the confidence and esteem in which he is held by Mayor Daley. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the City Club of Chicago the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Housing Authority, Terry Peterson. Terry? It's all yours, and you'll do the questions too. Don't worry. First of all, let me just say, Jay, thank you for those comments and also to acknowledge a friend of mine and one who has been a friend of my wife as well as my family, uh, State Representative Dan Burke. <laughs> Let me just say again, good afternoon and thank you for having me back at the City Club. A little over two years ago, I came here to talk with you about my new job at Chicago Housing Authority. I talked about how difficult the road would be, about the cycle of failure and despair that have trapped whole generations of children and families in public housing for decades. I talked about crime, family breakdown, and substandard housing. But mostly, I talked about the isolation of public housing residents in the city of Chicago. Isolation from the surrounding community, from the city, from healthy neighborhoods with stores, parks, schools, and churches where communities rally and come together. But I also talked about commitment, a commitment that began in June of 1999 when the mayor took control of the Chicago Housing Authority. His new team started by cutting waste, reducing staff by 80%, putting in place a series of financial reforms and brought in professionals to run properties, working in partnership with resident leadership, elected officials, and other community stakeholders, we created a bold new plan that was approved by HUD, which laid the foundation for everything that we've accomplished in the past two years to meet our core commitment to public housing residents. And from day one, that commitment has been crystal clear. Every family that was least compliant as of October the 1st, 1999, and who remains least compliant by paying their bills, being a good neighbor, will have the opportunity to come back to a new or rehab unit at the end of the plan for transformation. In raw numbers, that means that at the end of the day, Chicago will have approximately 25,000 public housing units, about 10,000 for seniors, 15,000 for families, including scattered sites, low rises and townhomes, many of which will be in beautiful new communities. But contained within that single promise is a lot more than just bricks and mortar. The mayor wouldn't be, simply, wouldn't be satisfied with simply rebuilding homes. He sent me to CHA to rebuild neighborhoods, something that I have a passion for and something that I've spent the past 12 years doing as a city planner 
and as an assistant to the mayor and as an alderman in the 17th Ward. And that's a far more complex effort, but far more enduring as well. It's more complex because it will mean that public and private agencies, community and non-for-profit groups, commercial and residential developers must sit down with residents and work together. It means that we must all put our differences aside and unite behind a common vision. It is more enduring because when you put in place the cornerstone of a great neighborhood, things such as parks and schools and businesses as well as new housing, you laid a foundation on which real and meaningful and lasting change can occur. The kind of change that passes on from father to son, mother to daughter, generation to generation. Needless to say, this doesn't happen overnight. Some people say that it will never happen because these communities are so embittered by decades of broken promises. Some say that it will cost more money than we have today. Still others feel that we will be more successful in some areas than others. And I've tried in the past two years of making any predictions or making any promises. But the one thing that I said day one when I took this job and I continue to say today, failure is not an option. The mayor has put everything on the line. He's told every agency under his control to support this effort. And because of the mayor commitment, it has led to new parks, police stations, and more affordable housing side by side with public housing, thousands of jobs for public housing residents, new schools for our students, new infrastructure that includes new water mains, new sewers, new streets at each of our mixed income developments. And as I stand here today, I could rattle off a string of accomplishments that would make most managers proud, from closing a $47 million budget deficit to passing three balanced budgets in a row without tapping into any of our reserves. I could tell you how crime is down in CHA and how we've helped over 3,000 residents find full-time employment. I can show you that about 2,000 residents have successfully relocated into the private market, and many of them are on a path to a better life. Over 12,000 residents are finding, are finding needed social services under the service system program that we created. I can talk about how we will rehab at the end of the year over 6,000 units and will be well past the halfway point by the end of 2003 with over 14,000 units ready for occupancy. I can tell you that next year res more residents will be moving back into CHA than those that are moving out. And for those who want to see our vision of a healthy mixed income community coming to life, I can point to Cabrini Green, once considered the most notorious housing project in America. Today there's a new Dominic shopping mall, complete with a Starbucks coffee shop, new park, new police station, firehouse, and scores of new homes where public housing residents are living side by side of working families and professionals. I can point to a new community center that is set to get under construction at Fosco Park near Abla, and new mixed income finance deals that will be signed by the end of the year at Horner and Lakefront. I can show you plans of neighborhoods that will blossom on the sites of Robert Taylor, Wells Matton, Stateway, and elsewhere, with new parks, schools, streets, retail, commercial development. Or more importantly, I can show you how within two years, we have closed 11 mixed finance deals compared to four that were closed from 1988, 1989 to 1999, prior to the mayor taking over. The proof of our progress is everywhere, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished. However, the truth is, there's still so much to do. And I don't want to use this opportunity to just talk about some of the initial milestones of success. Instead, I want to enlist your support and participation in this effort. 
And I want to also energize you to get involved. I want to use this opportunity to answer those who would say that we're moving too fast and now is not the time. I want to say that one of the things that inspires me day in and day out is a book that was written and it's called Why We Can't Wait. And I keep this book with me most of the time and a lot of time it reflects on some of the challenges that Dr. King had in the civil rights movement in the 60s. And it reminded me when I was listening to some of my critics and it dawned on me that there is never a right time to do what is right. There is never a right time to fight for what is right. Fighting for what is right is not a sometime thing. Fighting for what is right is not a seasonal thing. Fighting for what is right must be an everyday thing. And I'm reminded of those who told Dr. King during his fight for justice in Birmingham, Alabama, that he was moving too quickly, asking for too much too soon that he should wait for a better time. But I remember Dr. King's response when he said to them that there is never a perfect time and that when you wait, wait almost always means never. And so like Dr. King, I must say to the naysayers that my response is that I've seen too much pain and hum humiliation, resignation and defeat amongst children and families in public housing here in Chicago to wait. I've seen the fear of change, the self-defeating sense of comfort and security amongst residents living in squalor with no hope of opportunity or improvement. The life that they know, no matter how miserable, is more secure than the future they don't know, no matter how filled with promise. And while I'm always sensitive to everyone's concern, as a matter of fact, the plan was extended from five years to 10 years. But I must respectfully say to them that it would never be a better time than now to move forward. This chance to rebuild public housing will never come again. The combination of the mayor's vision and leadership, HUD support, 10 years of guaranteed funding, and a thriving housing market have, has provided a unique window of opportunity. But there's an even more compelling reason to move forward. And it's a capture of a photograph that I keep in my office. It's a picture of a nine-year-old little boy. He's facing away from the camera, looking at one of our high-rise buildings. And the first thing that you notice about this little boy is that he appears to be all alone. And he appears to be lost in a moment of longing. And then you notice something very painful, something that cast a dark mood over the entire picture. Stuck in the back of his pants is a pistol. And that's when it really hits you that this child is not just alone and isolated and removed, but he is also doomed. His chance of escaping an early death or life in prison is slim to none. When I look at that picture and see that child, I know again why we can't wait. When I walk through public housing and see young men who've never experienced working a full-time job, I know that we can't wait. When I see teenage mothers raising two and three children who will never have the opportunity to realize their potential or make their dreams come true, I realize that we can't wait. When I see whole neighborhoods abandoned by every legitimate business except liquor stores, I know why we can't wait. We've lost too many children in public housing to gang, to drugs, to violence, to say that now is not the time to move forward in this city and transform public housing. These are the life patterns and the environment that we must change. We must change it first by rebuilding homes for our residents. Second, we must create mixed income communities where we can put market rate housing aside by public housing and affordable housing, new as well as rehab, so that you will not be able to tell the difference between the three. 
We must create communities where residents are no longer isolated in this city or in communities. Third, we must start to work with our partners and other city agencies to provide community anchors that are so important to a healthy neighborhood. Amenities like schools and parks and new infrastructure. Fourth, by working with commercial developers and business leaders, we need to bring in new stores and jobs into CHA communities. Fifth, we need to start working with the city and also community social service providers to help our residents get access to job training, drug treatment, daycare, so that they too can move towards self-sufficiency. And finally, by highlighting our successes, but we also must realize that we will make mistakes along the way. But making mistakes is not the problem. Being knocked down is not a problem. What is a problem is that when you knock down, you need to get up. If you stay on the ground when you knock down, then that's a problem. And for 40 years, we've been knocking down public housing residents. Now is the time to help them get up. We must also change the image of public housing from a crime-written, dysfunctional community to a healthy, thriving neighborhood. And I want to acknowledge a few residents here today to share their stories of success as well as struggle, both to salute them for their success and to hold them up as examples of what public housing residents can do when given a hand up and not a hand out. Latoria Wolf, who's sitting to my left, is a third generation public Latoya is a third generation Robert Taylor resident, but unlike her mother and grandmother, she's going to college. She's in a fiction writing program at Columbia College, working on a novel about two young ladies growing up in public housing, one who was able to make it out and the other who was not. Janelle McDonald grew up in Madden Homes and is about to become the first member of her family to finish college. She's on scholarship at Olive Harvey and she's planning to become a school teacher. And then there's Roxanne Wyatt, who has had a number of challenges in her life, but today is working at Lathrop Homes, where she lives. And And also to my left is also we have Jose Cruz, who grew up in scattered site housing and is now attending classes at the University of Illinois. <laughs> Cynthia Baldwin, who couldn't be here today, but who also grew up in scattered site housing. Today she is a middle manager at Russ Presbyterian and working on her MBA. We have three other public housing residents here today who are also success stories. John King, one of our seniors, Kenya Richmond, and also Julio Candelera. Would all of them please stand so that we could give them a round of applause? <laughs> all these stories have two things in common. These individuals were willing to work hard, and individuals like you and me were willing to give them a chance. And I've been saying for the past two years that the vast majority of public housing residents are decent, hardworking, law-abiding individuals who want the same thing as you and me. A decent job, a nice place to live, to raise their family, and a good quality of life. They want a neighborhood with a grocery store, a park, a school, a place to rent videos, a place to buy a pair of shoes, or just a place to go and have a cup of coffee with a friend. All they want is a chance to do something that is real and meaningful, a chance to show how much they can contribute, and a chance to fulfill their dream. So as we look to the year ahead, we expect to break ground at seven of our nine major mixed income developments. By the end of 2003, we will finish all of our senior and scattered site housing. And as I said before, 
more than half, we will be more than halfway complete with, with the units, with over 14,000 units complete. And again, more residents will be moving back into CHA than are moving out. And while these are considerable achievements for CHA and will go a long way toward showing residents and the city as a whole that this is a new agency, under the steady guidance of our board chair, Sharon Gaskillian, and staff, whose only mission and goal is to improve the quality of life for public housing residents here in this city. I must repeat again that for us, failure is not an option. But ultimately, the plan for transformation will not be measured in bricks and mortar. It will be measured in terms of human success stories. Human success stories like the ones that you heard today. We will measure our success not in square footage, but in terms of quality of life and in the intangibles that enable public housing residents the opportunity to achieve their goals. And I will know when we have succeeded, when the picture of that little boy with the guns in his pants is no longer possible. I will know that we have succeeded when the young men, the young men that I talked about without jobs is no longer typical. I will know that we have succeeded when public housing apartments look just like market rate homes next door. And the children of those two households are playing together on the sidewalks. I will know that we have succeeded when CHA neighborhoods look and feel like yours and mine with quality schools and parks overflowing with children and families, stores filled with shoppers and people from communities working behind the counter. I will know that we have succeeded when public housing in Chicago is the national model for community renewal and a symbol of success for a proud and progressive city like ours. I will know that we have succeeded when public housing children wake up each morning in a safe, decent home and walk into a world without barriers or borders to fulfill their dreams and goals. And until that day come, we have much work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. The City Club has asked me that if there's anyone with a question, I think there's a mic in the middle of the room that's here. If you would come up, give your name, and ask your question. Uh, I'm open to questions. It's right here in the middle of the room. If there's anyone with a question. Well, Jay, that's a good sign, I guess. <laughs> All right. I wonder, could you evaluate the uh, private management program, turning over to private management? Has that come up to your expectations? Have there been problems with it? What's the quality of performance in your view? I believe that things are a lot better. I think if you talk with public housing residents today, I think we're addressing the issue of emergency work orders faster. I think it's down now. Emergency work orders are being addressed within 24 hours. Regular work orders are being addressed within 24 hours. Now we've got a process in place where we've got a larger pool of property managers that if you don't perform, we've got quality managers in the hopper ready to step in and take your place. So I would say that we're moving forward and things are getting better. Any other questions? Good afternoon, yeah, Jerry. My friend, my colleague. <laughs> there are some who have been critical of the Housing Authority for taking down so many units before yeah. new ones are available. Yes. And I know in my ward, for example, we've been working for a number of years to bring new units to the market. How would you yeah. respond to that? Well, one, and, and this appeared, I think, in uh, Monday's paper, um, we've taken down, as of today, since the mayor took over the Chicago Housing Authority, 7,000 units. Of the 7,000 units that we've taken down, only 2,000 of those units were occupied. Since the time that we've taken down those units, we've also brought back a little bit over 1,200 units for public housing residents. And let me just get to, because that's a question that seems to come up a lot about demolition, outpacing new units coming back online. 
First of all, there was a, a process, it was a, a I want to say, a, a, it was called the HUD 202 viability test. And basically, housing authorities had to go out to each of their units, do an assessment to figure out that it cost more to rehab that unit and last over, in over a 20 year period, or was it cheaper to just issue a person a voucher? All of our 53 gallery style high rise buildings, the 16 story buildings, failed the HUD viability test. So the reason that we're taking them down, one, they failed the HUD vi viability test. Two, because those buildings, after 40 years of deferred maintenance, had become absolutely nothing more than warehouses for the poor. No one should have to live like that. We never should have isolated public housing. And not only are we taking them down to rebuild mixed income communities, just as you have 40 years of deferred maintenance on the buildings, you've got 40 years of deferred maintenance in terms of the infrastructure under the building. We won't even get into 40 years of deferred maintenance in the residents who were treated like separate citizens in this city. I say it this time and time again, public housing residents are Chicagoans first, public housing residents second, and should have access to the same services and benefits as everyone else. But getting back. <laughs> getting back to why we have to take down buildings. Before you can build mixed income communities, we've got to go in and do environmental remediation. We've got to go in and put in new sewers, new water mains, new curbs. We've got to do temporary roads during the construction period. You cannot rebuild communities one building or one space at a time. You rebuild communities blocks at a time. And so that's why we're moving forward. But more importantly, it's a HUD mandate because they felt the viability test. Two, because they had become absolutely nothing more than warehouses for the poor, and no one should have to live like that. Hi, greetings. You started your remarks today by saying one of the things you wanted to accomplish was to enlist the support of people in this room. Yes. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how, how people can be helpful. I think the most important thing that the individuals in this room can do is to give public housing residents a chance. I talked about the success stories here, but for them to go to school and get a degree and come out and not have a job waiting for them, that makes absolutely no sense. For them to go to a trade school, if we put them in an apprenticeship program, there should be a job available for them. If you really want to help a person move forward in life towards self-sufficiency, give them a job. We need jobs for public housing residents. That's how you move towards self-sufficiency. So I would say to every business person in here, if you want to come up with, if there's one thing you can do to help us, help us to find jobs for public housing residents. Why is that important? And I say this, and I thought about this coming over here. If you care about me, then you should care enough about me to want me to live in the same kind of home you live in. You should care about me enough to want me to drive the same kind of car that you drive. You should care about me enough to make sure that I can send my kids to the same school you send your kids to. That's caring about me. <laughs> caring about me should not, being t should not mean telling me to wait. It should not mean telling me that now is the right time. There's never a right time in life to do anything. But if you've got goals and dreams, you've got to push forward. My goal is that if I fall down, I'm going to fall going forward. I won't fall going backwards. If I fail, and I've said this before, failure is not an option for me. But if I fail, I will fall on the battlefield. I don't mind this cross. This is a cross that I'm willing to bear. To bear. Why? Because I believe what I'm doing is not just right, but it's morally right. I believe for those of us, for those of us that have been blessed, most of us will leave this room. We're not concerned about what we're going to eat later on this evening. We're not concerned with guns and drugs confronting us as we walk into our homes. So if you really care about public housing residents, help them to move forward by giving them a job. I'm so glad you mentioned education because my next question is, we all know that good schools are so important to make these communities work. And how is the CHA working either with CPS or with others to, to help with that mission? We have monthly meetings with Arnie uh, Duncan over and, and also Michael Scott. And I've always said this in all of the forums that I've had a chance to speak in, that we are locked at the hip in terms of moving forward with the Board of Education. For the first time, CHA is at the table. For the first time, CHA residents are part of the plan. You know, no matter what barriers you will encounter in life, the one key is education. 
And I think that we've got to make sure as we rebuild these communities, the Board of Education is at the table. You will see in most of the communities, and I point it to Cabrini Green. You've got the new Jenner School there. You've got the Walter, Walter Payton School. You, I mean, you've got the new Seward Park. You've got the new North, North, uh, near North Library that's being built. If you go to Fosco Park on Ashland, we now have the new commercial that's there, a new grocery store. I think it's a jewel. You've got a bank there. We're going to be building a new Fosco Park along there. On Roosevelt Road, we're going to build a fire station. But school and education, as you said, is absolutely the key if we want to stop this cycle of kids and generations of families living in poverty. Um, I'm glad to see that CHA is committed because currently most of the schools in those, in those communities that you are trying to work with mm -hmm. are on the No Child Left Behind's failing list. Yeah. So we have a lot of work to do, so I'm looking forward to working together with you on that. And, and I appreciate that. You're absolutely right. And it's going to take all of us pulling together. I've said with something this important to the city of Chicago, nobody can afford to stand on the sideline as a spectator. And the best example that I can give is the South Loop area. If someone had told you 25 years ago, between Roosevelt Road, Congress, Michigan to Clinton, that the South Loop would look as it looks today, no one would have believed it. 25 years ago, you could have almost given that land away. But because the private sector, the public sector, state, federal, foundation community, the civic community all came together to say that we're going to make sure that this becomes a reality. That's the same kind of commitment that we need to have behind transforming public housing in the city of Chicago. Hi, my name is Andrea Whitsett. I am a resident of the Chicago Housing Authority under the, um, the Scattered Sites program. And my question, it's not even a question, my statement is to every company that's out here, um, Thanks to the Bronner Group, which hired me six weeks ago, and hopefully I will become permanent. But because of the Section 3 program, there is an opportunity for um, residents. Not everyone that lives in public housing wants to stay at the level that they're at. I graduated from school from Spanish Coalition because I live in an all-Hispanic community, May 3rd. And I didn't even know anything about the Section 3 program, but because of a Good Neighbors workshop that I went to, I had my resume with me anyway, my portfolio, I'll carry it around. And I just happened to tell, you know, when it was over, I just said, look, are you all hiring? <laughs> you know, and I said, I have, I graduated from office technology, and I said, I have basic skills, but I'm willing to start anywhere. Just get me in the door, and it's left up to me, the individual. I plan on going back to school in January, but in the meanwhile, my thing is to every company that's out here, give a resident a chance. Because if you don't give us a chance, what's going to happen? I'm just a normal person. I happen to live in CHA housing, but it's not where I want to stay. One day I want to own my own home for my three children. Good afternoon, sir. My name is George Williams. I work with TAS Incorporated. I just want to say thank you, sir, publicly because you took a chance, you stepped out of your comfort zone and took a position that is very, very challenging. I understand, I'm not there, and I know all of it, but I know what's happening at CHA. I just wanna say thank you publicly for having this courage to, to do what you're doing. And I too are, is reading the same book, Why We Can't Wait. It's, it's, it's a very critical book and we can't wait. Something has to be done. My agency is at your disposal, TAS Incorporated. We have a lot of things we can volunteer to do to help out. I was at a meeting today over in, at, at the Grand Blue Rock Federation uh, uh, Housing Subcommittee regarding Robert Taylor and, and, and the State Street Corridor. So we are there with you, and we are at your disposal, sir. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Let me just say, I don't think I've ever been in a forum where I've not said something about what my mom always tells me. Um, every Sunday I go over and I take my mom her paper and her coffee and that's really the time we spend our quality time, Jay. And two weeks ago I went over and my mom <coughs> said, man, you're getting a lot of gray in your beard. Um, <laughs> two years ago when I started this job I had no gray in my beard. <laughs> but as I said to my mom and she continues to remind me, she says, Terry, one of the things that you have to do in life as you go through life, and that is always remember where you came from. Always remember there was someone who gave you an opportunity. And so I thank you for those comments of willing to reach back and help those that we still need to pull forward. Thank you. Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs. 
airing every Monday night at 8.30 on Can TV, Channel 21. All right, All right Jeff. <laughs> and we'd like to have you on our program, Terry. All right, I look forward to coming on. Milton Friedman, the uh, great economist from the University of Chicago, speaking recently quoted Wilbur Cohen, who I think was previously, a long time ago, Secretary, Secretary of HEW when there was an HEW, as saying that when you design a program for the poor, it will be a poor program. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if, uh, if that's on the CHA's mind as you've tended to focus on developing more mixed income housing developments as opposed to developments solely focused on the poor. That is, is that what you're trying to do is get a program that's broader and better because it's not designed for the poor? We want public housing residents to be able to live in communities throughout the city. We want to end the years of isolation. We want to re remove the stigma associated with living, public with living in public housing. We want the children in public housing to have the opportunity to get up in the morning and see professionals going to work, doctors, lawyers, teachers. We want to create an environment where public housing residents will have the opportunity to, re to realize their future and their dreams. Here's the most important thing that I think that we got away from with the Chicago Housing Authority that we've now gotten back to. The Chicago Housing Authority is a housing agency. It is not a program agency. Those agencies that are responsible for serving the rest of Chicago, they now are responsible for serving Chicago housing residents. If there's a job program, then we're gonna work with the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. If we have senior issues, we're gonna work with the Department of Aging. If we have drug and homelessness issues, we will work as we've continued to work with the Department of Human Services. We're now in the housing business and we're absolutely trying to create a community where it's not a program that's targeted toward just public housing residents. What we're attempting to do is to make sure that as neighborhoods and communities are rebuilt, public housing is now a part of it as opposed to being isolated from it. Hi, my name is Jerome Jackson, and I'm from the CARA program. Yes. And uh, something that matters is a statement. I really applaud CHA for going out and bringing an agency to Stateway to work with non-leaseholders, right. people that are there illegally, uh, drug addiction, homelessness. And we've been able to bring people to uh, agency, other agencies, to shelters, to treatment centers. And it's just been, I'm there five days a week, eight hours a day. I'm on them galleries. I'm in those places. I'm in those trenches. I met you two weeks ago with Francine, yes. and we walked the buildings. Exactly. And it's been a blessing for me to be able to reach back and to help someone because I didn't come out of a uh, state way, but I came out of drug addiction and alcoholism. So now I'm reaching back to try to help somebody. And I thank CHA for giving us those opportunities to be able to help residents, to see a woman come to me with three little children and nowhere to turn to, nowhere to go, hurting. I took a lady just yesterday with three children to Salvation Army Emergency Lodge on the north side. She had never been outside of Stateway. She didn't even know what the uh, north side looked like. As we was driving Lakeshore Drive, she was just sitting there looking because she had never really been outside of that community. So I understand what you're talking about, Mr. Peterson, and I see you there, and I just really want to applaud uh, CHA for the efforts that they are doing. Thank you. Thank you. And before the question, let me tell you, and you never hear about the success stories. Unfortunately, with CHA, unless they're shooting, killing, drugs or gangs, you never hear about the success stories. Doing that walk down at CHA of Stateway Gardens, we encountered a grandmother with 10 kids, a grandmother who was not a leaseholder that we were able to find housing for. We also went in a unit, and you want to know something that tears at your heart of a mother and a daughter, a mother and a son, sitting in a chair for breakfast, they had split a sweet roll and were sharing it. That, that was all they were going to eat that day. No one should have to live like that. Unfortunately, 
again, when there are success stories like the ones that are sitting here, what I need for you to do when you leave this room is that as you talk with your friends, with your neighbors, you need to tell them about what's going on. You need to encourage them to get on board. And what I would say when you run into the critics, first thing I like to ask my critics, where do you live? Where do you live? If you're going to criticize me, if you're going to walk in my shoes, where do you live? Where do you send your kids to school? What have you done? What are your success stories? And since you've been around so long, what can you point to as a success? Let me stop. Come on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine Cho, and I'm here with Deloitte and Touche with their public sector and not-for-profit practice. And I was just curious as to what the CHA and maybe alongside with Mayor Daly was doing in terms of providing incentives to the private sector industry with the development and of these public housing. Like, I know there's a supply problem with affordable housing, and I was wondering what concrete steps you guys were taking over the next five to ten years to provide incentives to developers, construction companies. Well, I know I saw a friend here from IIT. Uh, I thought I saw IIT here. Okay, all right, right here. And I know the mayor met with them two weeks ago, and I had a chance to meet with them. One, we've, been talk we've talked about the employee uh, a, a homeowner a, a assistant program. We've met with 25 of the top universities here in the city, and we've said to them that we need them to get involved. A lot of the universities are near public housing developments. We've talked with them. A lot of their faculty live out in the suburbs. We've talked about them purchasing some of the market rate units, as well as some of the affordable rental units that are going to come online. And I was with the mayor at, a, at a, one of his meetings, a civic meeting, where he challenged the civic community to also get involved, the business community to get involved and to step up and provide opportunity in the form of a job for public housing residents. Again, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it, and I look forward to coming back, Jay.